Well, now it's time for our words. So let's go to Matthew chapter 26. I'm going to read in your hearing verses 36 through 41. That's Matthew chapter 26, verses 36 through 41. You can read along in whatever version that you may have, and I'm going to read from the English Standard Version. Here's what the word of the Lord says. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Verse 41, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I want to preach today from the subject in a very practical way. I'm not crazy. I want to preach, I'm not crazy. Let's pray. Father, have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Melinda is a 40-year-old mom who was unhappy with her physical appearance. And as she struggled with morbid obesity, caused by traumatic childhood trauma, she decided that she needed to do something about it. She visited Dr. Pat, who was the rather new plastic surgeon in town for a consultation on a number uh, of procedures and finally settled on getting a tummy tuck. After completing all the necessary releases, Melinda, true story, went in on the day she was scheduled for the surgery. Dr. Pat, although failed to inform Melinda that he had never performed a tummy tuck before and was not board certified. While in surgery, Dr. Pat also failed to notice that she was allergic to morphine and prescribed this for her pain. So when Melinda came out of surgery, she was in significant pain and sent home vomiting. Melinda was sent home with just a little bit of anti-nausea medication, but her husband had to bring her back within 12 hours because she never stopped vomiting and her pain continued to increase and a fever visited her body and severe dehydration kicked in. While in the ER, the doctors there discovered that she had been given morphine, which was counterproductive and counterintuitive to her medical records. And while experiencing violent reaction to the medication, they went in to find out that she was suffering from an infection because Dr. Pat, who had never done a tummy tuck before, actually opened her up and left gauze inside of her abdomen. True story, Dr. Pat never performed the tummy tuck despite charging her for the procedure. And within three months, that doctor was out of business and Melinda did not get a refund. Melinda had heard of these terrible, horrible uh, horror stories of surgical malpractice overseas, but she never thought she could experience something like that right here in the USA. Dr. Pat was guilty of malpractice, yet never really called to accountability. He was guilty of malpractice because, watch this, he was not qualified nor certified to perform the change that Melinda trusted her, trusted him to perform. He was guilty of malpractice. 
Now, the church has been promising people healing through our ministry. We promised a community that we would love, that we would serve, that we would represent the kingdom of God. We promised a community that if you joined our church, that you would be part of a community of love and acceptance of any and every issue people struggle with. We have advertised that we are a safe space and we are a people who can help people through life's deepest and darkest pains. We've caused people, we've caused people to believe that they can come and be just as they are and receive just what they've been looking for. But I fear, like this Dr. Pat, that we, the church, are guilty of spiritual malpractice. Stay with me tonight. We have promised something that we just don't do. We have advertised something that we just don't offer. We promise that in Christ, every area of your life will be better, but then we teach people that every area of their lives matter to God except their mental health. Huh, you didn't know I was going there tonight. We, we, we downplay emotions in the name of avoiding emotionalism. We tell them to open up their hearts to us only to leave them emotionally vulnerable to people who are not emotionally intelligent or healthy. We tell, we, 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 we encourage dangerous practices like staying in abusive relationships in the name of being a faithful wife. We, the church, justify and glorify unjust, unnecessary, and ungodly suffering so that people begin to buckle under the weight of things that God never intended for them to carry. Hear me tonight. We, the church, are guilty of the malpractice of religion. We opened people up like the surgeon and left the gauze of our trauma in their psyche. We, we left people greatly disfigured and in excruciating pain because of the demonic disconnect between science and religion. We have caused, I don't hear nobody tonight, we, we have caused countless people to not only leave church, but to give up on God because we taught them that God only wants their praise and he only wants their tithes, but keep their emotions and their feelings and their thoughts to themselves. We are malpracticing Christians. In the church, we practice spirituality in an erroneous and dangerous way. And like doctors are told, the first rule is to do no harm. The church has done great harm. And I know we don't want to hear this. I know we'd rather hear something that tells us about how great we are, how special we are, how unique we are, how peculiar we are, how different and perhaps even superior we are. But the truth is that we have practiced, we are guilty of the malpractice of spirituality because tonight, because today as I'm talking primarily about how we handle mental health. And I want to dispel some things straight from the Bible. This is not a lecture on mental health. This is a sermon talking about the life of Jesus. In fact, in just a moment, we're going to look at the last scenes of Jesus' life. And I want to pick apart, debunk, if you will, some myths about mental health, because for everyone who's watching and listening to this, you're professionals. Yes, you are, you are uh, hardworking individuals. Yes, you have degrees, and yes, you are educated, and yes, you have skill sets, and, and yes, you have gifts that you bring to the table. But the reality is 2020 
has been a rough year. And if you could just be honest with yourself today, all of us have struggled in some form or fashion with stress, with, with a lack of, 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 of energy to get up and do what we usually do, the social disconnection, not being able to worship with our brothers and sisters, not having the camaraderie of being in the building with the other employees, uh, the, the house being crowded with people and kids who would usually go off to school and, and for spouses who would usually go off to work. Our, our personal time has been infringed upon and it takes a toll on our psyche. Is there anybody here who knows that I'm what I'm talking about? That 2020 has been rough on your emotion, rough on your psyche, rough on your pattern of thinking. It's it's causing and triggering people to go into bouts of depression. It's causing people to seek out dangerous ways of compensating. It's causing emotional damage and emotional trauma from children all the way up to senior citizens. And today I want to debunk some myths about this, some myths that the church holds dear that causes us to do damage to ourselves and others. For if we are to be equipped to be the people of God in this day, we have to be healthy spiritually, physically, and mentally. One of the things, one of the things, one of the things that this text teaches us, one of the myths I want to debunk is this. Uh, there is this myth that the church has that causes us to practice religion in a way that is dangerous to people. And that is that depression is a lack of faith. You've heard it. Don't, don't act like you haven't heard it in church. Depression is a lack of faith. I remember I was pastoring a church right here in Atlanta, not the church I pastor now, thank God, but another church. And I slipped in, as pastors often do, into Sabbath school. I sat in the back because, you know, when the preacher sits near the teacher, the teacher will feel a need to always call on the pastor to answer every question. And so I said, I'm going to sit in the back and I'm going to see what Sabbath school teacher is going to say. And, and, and I remember that somehow the Sabbath school lesson veered towards this issue of depression and doubt. And I remember the Sabbath school teacher made this very dangerous statement. He said that depression is a sin. That's what the Sabbath school teacher said, that depression is a sin and that if you, you cannot be a true believer and be depressed. I was horrified. I could not believe. And of course, I had to, without being called on, make sure that that class did not leave without correcting that. But that idea is pervasive in our churches, even in our conferences. Around the world, you have saints, believers, Christians who believe that depression is a sin, that depression is a sign of a lack of faith. I want you to look at the text because this text helps to debunk some of these erroneous ideas that we have. Notice that Jesus says in the text, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. That's what the KJV, the King James Version says. Uh, the ESV, the version I'm reading from, it says very sorrowful. But in the original language, the word there that we translate as exceedingly or very, it says I'm swallowed up in sorrow. Swallowed up in sorrow means Jesus is literally describing a depressive episode that Jesus is at this, at this moment in the Garden of Gethsemane, depressed, deep sorrow. In fact, he says, it's such deep sorrow, it could lead to death. You see, what we say about depression and mental health and emotional wholeness betrays the truth of God's word. We say things when people ask you, you know, and we use these cliches that sometimes seem harmless, but they are quite dangerous to say things like, I'm too blessed to be stressed. 
That's a phrase that, that we say. And although I understand, uh, I understand the inclination of that statement, that statement really doesn't make much sense. Jesus was blessed, <laughs> and yet he is stressed. I don't know how believers are so blessed that you're more blessed than Jesus, that you can experience the stress and the strain and the sorrow that life brings like Jesus did. This text teaches us, this text teaches us that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, that Jesus, who is the greatest human being to have ever lived and to ever live, that Jesus himself was stressed. And it is a dangerous thing when we begin to believe the work and the, the idea of the enemy that if we are depressed, that if we have depressed thoughts, that if we have thoughts of doubt, that if we are sad for protracted times, that we lack faith. For if that were true, then Jesus was not that blessed. Then Jesus didn't have faith. And if we actually believe that depression is a sin or to doubt or to ask questions or to go through times of protracted sorrow and sadness, then we're in trouble. See, really where this comes from, it's historical in the church. It really comes from the vilification of emotion. <laughs> you better preach, Holy Ghost. The vilification, that is to vilify, to make a villain of emotion. Historically, emotion was made the villain of Christianity. This was purported and promulgated by the Catholic Church, but Protestant churches have picked it up, particularly, hear me today, particularly those who are more of a conservative bent, like our denomination. We picked up on this vilification of emotion. And in this vilification of emotion, emotions were viewed as the enemy of faith. This worked, this worked, uh, this was done purposeful by those, particularly Europeans, who worked for the justification of exploitation, oppression, and corruption. They would say things that if uh, they tell you that if uh, they, if, 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 they tell you anger is wrong, then you won't be angry about things you need to be angry about. If they tell you sadness is wrong, then you will not grieve the loss of your liberty. If they tell you anger is wrong, then you won't be angry about slavery. If they tell you grief is wrong, you don't mourn the thousands slain, uh, slain by police. If, if they tell you that you're discontent is, uh, is synonymous with not having faith, then you allow them to steal your voice, to take away your reason, and to degrade your humanity. It is here that the vilification of emotion promulgates this idea that this lie of the enemy, that you can't be sad and love God at the same time. But here, Jesus shows us as he's here in the Garden of Gethsemane, about to go to the cross, that he is exceedingly sorrowful and yet still anointed. That he is exceedingly sorrowful and yet God still has his eye on him. That he is exceedingly sorrowful. He is having a depressive mode and yet God is still with him. And if Jesus could be sad, if Jesus could be stressed, if Jesus could be depressed, if Jesus could go through a dark period, then why can't you? I came tonight to free you, to help you to understand that what you are going through, you might not be going through depression, but maybe you're going through a rough patch where you can't focus and it's a rough patch and you're, you're not as motivated to go to work like you used to. You need to understand it has something to do with the fact that you're in a pandemic. And child of God, it's okay to go through seasons and to feel the weight of the emotions of those seasons. It is a lie of the enemy. The devil is a liar that it is not. It is not a sin to feel sad, a sin to be depressed, a sin to go through a dark time. It just means you're like Jesus in that way. And if you're like Jesus any day, I'd like to be like Jesus. The first thing we've got to get rid of is this idea that depression 
is a lack of faith. Depression is sin. Here is Jesus. He's in the garden. He's our Lord. He's about to be in this text. He's on his way to becoming our savior on the cross. And yet he is in a deep and dark place of depression. Here's the second thing. Here's the second thing you need to see. Uh, there is this other lie that we must debunk tonight. I just want to be real practical to help you. Uh, there's another lie we have to get rid of. We have to throw out. It is this, that real Christians don't need help. Real Christians don't need help. Uh, I, 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 a church, uh, I, I want to tell you about this church in my conference, a church in my conference that, as you know, most churches at least should be, Practicing social distancing. Oh, I know my church is totally virtual. We've been having our services online exclusively since March. And it has been the good counsel of the CDC and other health organizations and public health organizations that we should indeed remain that way for now. Well, one of my churches uh, in our conference said, no, we're going to get together and we're going to have in-person worship. We're not going to mandate mass. We're actually going to have a choir sing, 30 people in the choir, and there they are singing and praising God. And, and their statement to the conference and the statement to those who asked what was going on and why they were doing this, our God, our God, we have faith. Our God will keep us and we will not get sick. Well, that church right now, I have to tell you, weeks after doing this, experienced a breakout of COVID-19 cases. And it is because of this erroneous idea that, that being sensible, hear me, I want you to get this, being sensible does not make you spiritually weak. I want to say that again. Being sensible does not make you spiritually weak. Taking precaution does not mean you are spiritually weak. Wearing a mask does not mean that you are spiritually weak. Going to the doctor does not mean that you are spiritually weak. Taking medicine does not mean that you are spiritually weak. It simply means that you are practicing both faith in God and common sense. You're saying, wait a minute, preacher, where are you going? I don't see this in the text. Look at the text. Jesus turns to his disciples as he's about to turn and make that turn towards Calvary in the Garden of Gethsemane. He brings his disciples. He brings them. He brings all 12. But then he, he brings, I'm sorry, 11, because we know one has already left. He brings 11 to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he says, you all stay here. He brings three of the 11, the three that are closest to him, to another spot. And watch what he says. He says, watch with me. He says, I need you to stay here and I just need you to watch with me. Now, don't miss the magnitude of this moment. For if you over-spiritualize it, you'll miss what Jesus is doing. Remember, Jesus is our example. And I think you would agree that he is our example in all things. If he is our example in all things, then watch the example of Jesus. In his time of great sorrow, he calls three close friends, the three out of the 11, and says, I need you to watch with me. My God, don't miss what he's about to do. Watch with me does not simply mean sit here. But in the Greek, watch with me literally means look after me. Whoa, did you do you understand that Jesus is what he's saying in a real sense is he's saying, I need you, me, Jesus, the savior of the world, me, Jesus, the one who spoke the world into existence in pre-incarnate state, me, Jesus, the one who turned water into wine, me, Jesus, who made the lame leap, the blind see, and the deaf hear, me, Jesus, who even who even made people get out of the grave. I need your help. I need you to watch over me. Jesus is not asking now for spiritual revelation, nor is Jesus talking even to his father yet. He's talking to other human beings and saying, I need you to watch over me. Look out for me. See, this is why he says the spirit is willing, but the flesh 
is weak. He's not only referring to the sleeping disciples who he would find sleeping later, he's referring to himself. Jesus needed human help in his time of need. Hmm. And somebody needs to hear that today because you've been spiritualizing your, your situation. You've been saying, well, all I need to do is just trust God a little bit more. All I need to do is just have some more holy conversation. All I need to do is just read my Bible a little bit more. And while all those things are good, and while you need to continue doing those things, here's what you've got to understand from the example of Jesus in this story. The example of Jesus is he did not reach for spiritual help yet. He said, I need both the spiritual and I need the human. I need you, Peter. I need you, James. I need you, John, to watch over me. I know God is watching me. I know my father is looking at me. I know that he cares what's going on with me, but I need to know that you care. I need a human voice. I need human eyes. I need somebody to watch with me. This is the genius of the Christian community. This is why you can't be a Christian all by yourself at home by just watching sermons online and saying, I love God. I don't like the church. That's not how it works. We need to have community because we need to have people watching with us, people looking after us, people checking us and making sure we're okay, people holding us accountable, people interceding on our behalf. But watch this, not only in the spiritual, but in the, in the practical. See, this is what I'm trying to let you know. Some of you have been struggling all 2020 because you have just been going to church on Zoom, getting all the sermons until you're in sermon overload, Praying all the prayers you can pray, talking to folk, but you ain't talking to the right people. And may I suggest to you that you need some human help. Human help means you need some counseling. Human help means you need some therapy. Human help means you need somebody to talk to you, to sit you down on the couch, a professional who, yes, can be a Christian, yes, can be a believer, but also is trained to be able to work through childhood trauma. Come on, somebody, to work through pathology in a way you've been working your life and thinking about life and to challenge and to change the way that you think so that you can change the way that you live. Jesus says, I needed help. And I'm wondering today why you don't need help. Why is it that Jesus needed human people to look after him, but you don't need anybody? Why? Because it's this third thing. And then I'll get out your way. This third thing I want to debunk, this third myth that the enemy has raised up in the church. This is why we practice things, why we have the malpractice of spirituality. This, this myth, this third one I want to get rid of is just pray it away. All you got to do is pray it away. All you got to do with your issue is just pray it away. Luke 22, uh, Luke 22, don't turn there. I'll just tell you what it says. In Luke chapter 22, verse 43, it says, and, and this is a same account of the same story. Luke is writing about this same instance in the Garden of Gethsemane. Look at what Luke says. He writes, and there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. <laughs> and being in great agony, Jesus prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Mm, don't miss this. Jesus needed someone to strengthen him in his time of deep sorrow and prayer. And prayer alone didn't take away his severe stress. Mm. Jesus had been praying. If you read the story, he prays more than once and he's still stressed. He prays more than once and he's still going through. He prays more than once and he's still struggling. He prays more than once and he still is wrestling with surrendering his will. He prays more than once and yet he still needs help. And you, there's some things, do I have a witness, that you can't just 
pray away. Wait a minute, preacher. Are you telling me that there's not power in prayer? No, that's not what I'm telling you. There's power in prayer, but it is, it is insightful, is it not? That while Jesus was struggling through prayer, God the Father, who was all wise and all knowing, said, you know what? Prayer is not enough to get my son through to his purpose. I've got to send an emissary from, from heaven. I've got to send an angel. And the Bible says the angel ministered to him, which means this is a perfect example of how a prayer and actual help go together. That Jesus made it to the cross not just by praying him his way there, but by also having help to get there. And that's how you're going to get through. That's how you're going to get through. You're going to get through because you will have not only your power, your powerful, persistent prayer, but you will also need the help of human beings equipped by the Holy Spirit, sent by God himself to help you make sense of what's going on in your head. Here's what I'm preaching tonight. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy that sometimes I don't feel like opening my word because of the darkness and the shadow that comes over my life every now and again. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy that I've been stressed out in 2020 trying to figure out how to pastor in the midst of a pandemic when I never had a class or seminar on it and I don't know how to do a church virtually exclusively. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy every now and again when I don't have that pep in my step. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. When I don't feel like getting up and leading another service, being on another online panel, giving another Bible study, making another pastoral call, I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. And guess what? You're not crazy. You're not crazy for having feelings of, of anxiety and even panic attacks during this pandemic. You're not crazy. You're not crazy for feeling a little bit of angst because you're cooped up in the house with people that you love. And for some of you, people that you don't love, you're not crazy uh, because you have to deal with the, with the issues of life with layers on top of layers and, and you can't get away and you can't escape and you can't give distance. You're not crazy. Guess what? You're just human. You're not crazy. You're not only human. Watch this. You're just like Jesus. Jesus went through a difficult and dark time. Jesus went through and needed help. Jesus went through and prayer was not enough. God says, look at my son struggling. And I want you to say, I want to say this before I get ready to take my seat. Understand that the, the stakes were high because if Jesus didn't get through Gethsemane, he couldn't get to the cross. If Jesus couldn't get to the cross, he couldn't get to the grave. If Jesus couldn't get to the grave and overcome death, then when you and I die, we would stay dead and we would not have the hope of eternal life. So God says the stakes are high. My son's got to get to the cross. He's struggling and the disciples, the human help he asked for, they're sleeping. Because you do know there's some people you'll ask to help you and they won't come to your rescue. But praise be unto God. God said, I'm going to send my angel. I'm going to give him some physical help. I'm going to encourage him. No doubt that angel whispered words of encouragement. No doubt that angel told him things that human words, perhaps, uh, that the disciples who were sleeping could not utter. And when that angel encouraged him, Jesus prayed a little bit more, sweat some blood, but at the end turned over his will. Why? Because he had to push through the darkness of the depression to get to his purpose. And that's what God is trying to do for you. He's trying to get you to push through the anxiety, push through the panic, push through the pathology, push through the, the negative thought patterns that have held you back and incarcerated you. Uh, he's trying to get you to push through everything that has been holding you back so that you can get 
to your destiny. And how will you get there? Not just by praying. The word tonight is you need some help because you ain't crazy. You're just human. And if you're human, you need somebody to come alongside you and tell you you're thinking about this the whole the wrong way. You need somebody to come alongside you and say, I know that's what you think, but can you think of it objectively? You need somebody to come along and say that you are more than what happened to you, but you can overcome. You are no longer a victim. You are a victor. And sometimes you need somebody to minister to you in a very real way, because if you can get your mind right, then you can get your life right, because your mind can be renewed. Jesus needed help. I need help. You need help. You're not crazy. You're, you're just human. Jesus wasn't crazy. He was just human. And perhaps one of the things you need to do during this season and during this, this week and, and during this time of refreshing, when you're getting these spiritual messages during this series, my prayer for you is that you will get some help. It's not unspiritual. It's not spiritually weak. It's, it's not that you don't believe in God. If Jesus asked for help, didn't get the help he asked for, and God sent an angel to minister to him to get him through, how much more do you and I need the help? Because it would be one thing to go through these services and to hear these sermons and these messages uh, every day and, and every night and yet have the same mindset, then nothing would change. The word of the Lord here tonight is that what you've experienced, here it is, what you've experienced all year long that you didn't tell anybody about, the stress and the strain that you didn't tell anybody about, or you, you weren't able to articulate, you're not crazy because you're not alone. All of us have, including Jesus. But if you will be like Jesus, you need to get some help. You need to get a Christian therapist. You need to talk to a, a spirit-filled mentor, uh, one who can, who's had life experience, who could be able to pour into your vessel. You need to talk to somebody who can tell you the truth about your situation, who is not afraid of your reaction. You, you need somebody to minister to you so that you can be free to get to your purpose, to minister to somebody else. Here's the word tonight, very practical tonight. As you get ready to go into 2021, if you want to get to your purpose like Jesus, if you're going to get through this garden of Gethsemane we are in right now, you're going to need some help. But you got to understand you're not crazy. You're just human. You're just like Jesus. If he needed help, how much more you and I? I want to pray for you. I want to pray that you humble yourself. And take an inventory and realize that what you're carrying, the loads that you're carrying, work, school, family, your own stuff, it's too much to carry by yourself. Then add the layer of a pandemic. But God is able. He is able to give you help. Hear me not just spiritual help. We know that. If you've been in the church, you got that. And hopefully you know how to access those resources. I'm talking about practical, mental, emotional help. That's why Jesus asked the disciples, will you please watch with me? Would you please look after me? Because I can't get through this by just praying I need someone to help me. My prayer for you right now is that this week you'll find somebody who is qualified, somebody sanctified, somebody sent by God. Ask God to send you, to lead you to somebody who can get you the help you need to get 
to your purpose. Father, we thank you that we're not crazy when we feel anxious and panicked during 2020, that this, this is not a figment of our imagination. We're not losing it. We're just experiencing what it is to be a human being under great distress. And Father, as a church, I pray on behalf of us a prayer of repentance. We confess, God, that we have practiced spirituality in a harmful way. We've told people to dismiss, to ignore, to denigrate uh, their, their emotions, their thoughts, their, their psychological well-being, God, when indeed you came to save us, mind, body, and spirit. So, Lord, I pray that you will give healing to each and every person right now. And may the healing begin by an awareness that, like Jesus, they need help. Thank you, God, for the help that I've received in my life. And I pray, God, that they will do the same. Thank you for the victory we see in Jesus. And may we have the same. For we ask it in his name. Amen. God bless you.